Well, greetings, everyone, and happy Easter. I can't believe that we are still not meeting. It feels like it's been so long since we've been together. Um, And I'm really missing Wednesday mornings. Um, I was just thinking today, there's so much about Wednesday mornings being together that I am really sad not to be enjoying. I'd say the first one was the delicious breakfasts that are prepared when I walk into church on Wednesday mornings. And I thought, I miss seeing everyone talking on the patio. I miss talking on the patio. I miss Christina's chimes to get me to stop talking on the patio. And as we go into the sanctuary, I'm missing that cute little Avon trying to shush us to get us to be quiet as Christina starts. I even miss Christina falling down the stairs. <laughs> Sorry, Christina, you're the one that made that so funny. Um, anyway, obviously I'm missing every part of it, but more than anything, I think I'm just missing our ability to be together to really study God's word. So this is hopefully the next best thing, and I look forward to when we can do this together. Okay, so this week, so the week of April 15th, we are on Galatians 5, 22 to 26, and I will read our passage, and in your study guides, if you want to read with me, it is on page 276. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Okay, so I have a question for all of you before we dive in. And I thought if you are following along on the PowerPoint and you are in a huge bookstore, um, say like Barnes and Nobles, like a fashion island, which do you think is traditionally the largest selection with the most books? If you had to guess, there's history, there's children's, there's biographies, there's politics, Sadly, the Christian sections are usually small. But what do you think is traditionally the the largest section? Well, surprisingly, the largest section is self-help books, how-to books. And I have to say I'm guilty of this too. I buy a ton of how-to books. So what does that say about us? I would say as a culture that we're always trying to prove ourselves. I know some of the many that I have bought over the years how to be a better parent, how to be a better wife, how to be a better cook, um, and on and on and on. And hopefully as believers, we should all be wanting the how-to book on how to grow as Christians. Well, happily, Galatians 5 is that how-to book for us. In fact, Tim Keller says that this passage that we are studying is the most crucial passage in understanding how to live the Christian life. He says you can't understand the Christian life if you don't understand Galatians 5. So in studying this, I realized, oh, there was a lot that I did not know and a lot for me to learn. So I hope you guys learned some stuff from this too. So in these past weeks, we've been learning about salvation. Well, we've known that Paul was very adamant about the Galatians knowing that they are justified because of what Christ did on the cross. Paul was passionate about exactly what we celebrated on Easter. And Paul was so mad at the Galatians for trying to add good works to what Jesus had already paid for on the cross. We are saved and justified. And today we are looking at our sanctification. Okay, another big word. What is sanctification? This is the process of growing and becoming more and more like Jesus. And Galatians is our how-to book, how to do that. At different times and different seasons, I will say in my quiet times that I will write down goals every Monday for for the upcoming week. It can be how many times I'm going to walk, the thank you notes I'm going to write, what relatives that are out of town that I'm going to call, And I realized in studying this the last couple weeks, I thought I should have had one overarching goal every week to become more and more like Jesus. But how 
do we do that? Well, Galatians is saying it happens with the fruit of the Spirit. So in front of you is the list of the fruit of the Spirit. And I'm sure a lot of you have memorized this. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I would say this is a daunting list. And I think we could say, but I don't have these in my life. How can I become like Jesus if I don't have these in my life? And the truth is what God says, yes, we do. As believers, as children of God, through faith in Jesus, we all have the seed inside of us for the fruit of the Spirit. (laughs) It might be in a dormant stage, but the seed is there. So we're going to talk about how to grow that seed into real fruit. So there's a picture of an acorn. We've all seen acorns. And the fascinating thing about that little acorn, totally encapsulated in that seed, is all that is needed to grow a huge oak tree. And that oak tree will produce more acorns and thus more oak trees. It all starts with a small seed. So you see what that one seed can create. So when Paul says, grow into your salvation, in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, this little boy is saying, crave pure spiritual milk so that it may grow up in your salvation, that we need to grow up in our salvation. He is saying we need to ripen the fruit of the Spirit. And it starts with a small seed in, in, in each one of us. I think <laughs> so many of us, we have excuses to not to live lives that look Christ-like. And he is saying, it's time to grow up. He's kind of saying, when are you going to grow up? You need to grow up and respond to the work that is already inside of you with that small seed. So we all, we all hear, hear the excuses, and I think we probably all have our own excuses. And this is just some of them, and I'd like you guys to be thinking about, what are my excuses for living the way I want to live? Um, I've heard young moms say, yeah, I scream at my kids, but my mom was a screamer, so I come by it naturally. Or a husband that is not kind to his wife, well, I'm just like my father. I can never change. It's in my genetics. And the old line, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, scripture is telling us here that we don't have to be like our past because we have the potential to be like Jesus. And I love this sign, this, this saying, it's up to us to break generational curses. When they say it runs in the family, you tell them this is where it runs out. So I think scripture is saying, I'm going to take away your excuses because I have a great work to do inside of you. And I have more for you than just what you're bringing from your past. So about 10 years ago, um, I was at a dinner party with about five different couples, and one of the husbands said, this picture is not of the dinner party, (laughs) this is just a random dinner party, but at the dinner party, one of the husbands said, um, this was his quote, well, I warned my wife before we got married that I'm critical and controlling, so she just knows that's how I am, and 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 I will never change. And I remember somebody said, and I think it was... Terry Gunlock, very sweetly said, she goes, well, you know, that's great that you warned her. And I said, but it's, and she said, but it's even better that the Holy Spirit can change us. And I thought this was a very nice way to say, grow up, grow up into your salvation. There is greater potential in you than you think there is. And you don't have to live like that anymore. Well, I had a very much needed lesson to grow up after college. (laughs) My dad was on his second marriage and headed for divorce after a horrible marriage and a divorce years before with my mom. So I had made a decision out of all that pain that I would never get married. I was convinced I wouldn't be good at it if I was anything like my parents, and I sure didn't see that marriage brought much happiness. Well, I had been dating my now husband, Kim Storm, for about six months. I guess I had neglected to share my fears with him. So one night, we, are, we go out on a date, and he has told all my friends, and he has an engagement ring, and he proposed. 
I have to tell you, I was shocked because of all the hurt from my family. I blurted out, which I'm embarrassed today to say I blurted out. I said, I'm never getting married. And if you're going to push that, we can't date anymore. So <laughs> if you know my husband, this is the part in the story when everybody says, oh, poor Kim, he's so nice. That is so mean. Anyway, <laughs> back to the main point. Some very wise Christian friends and a mentor spent some time basically saying, grow up. You are not your parents. You do not have to repeat their mistakes. If Christ is at the center of this, your life will be different. It was grow up to the potential you have in Christ and quit hanging on to your past. Well, I am obviously so grateful for those people, what they said. And people always ask, so when did he ask you again? Well, because I told him not to bring it up anymore. He never did ask me again, but six months later, I asked him, and I'm glad I did. So I think it's a, just a great lesson when we have all these excuses, or even when our friends have these excuses. God has so much more for us because of his spirit in us. Your past does not define you. God's power in our lives to become like Jesus should be what does. And this is a cute saying. When your past calls, don't answer. It has nothing new to say. So my question is for you guys, what excuses? What excuses do you give from your past to not be all that God has for you today? Stop giving excuses and just pray. So there was a British minister called G. Campbell Moore visiting a 600-year-old grave in Italy. And over the grave was a huge thick marble slab. Right in the middle of the marble slab was a tree growing. Obviously, before the slab was placed, some seed, maybe an acorn, obviously fell on top of the grave. The tree totally split this marble slab in half. And if I looked at a small seed and a huge marble slab, and I would say common sense tells me the marble slab is going to win. And we've all seen it on sidewalks where trees sprout up through cement. And I thought this is a great example of the power of God through our excuses, through our past, through whatever the enemy is going to say just tells us we can't grow. If plant growth has that much power, how much more power will the Spirit of God have in your life? Basically, we are without excuse. God's vision for each one of us is so much bigger than our own. He has set up and provided the means for us to experience all of his love, joy, peace, patience, etc., etc. But how? Well, absolutely not on our own. Just like our justification, we do not achieve this with our own good works. The way he says to do it, which is the title of our Bible study, Abide. The key to understanding this is why Paul uses the metaphors he does with fruits, seeds, branches in the vine. We abide and we are grafted in to the vine, which is Jesus. Fruit is the natural product of life. Why does a tree bear fruit? Not because there's some law of nature that says it must. It bears fruit simply because of the life within it rising up from the soil and water that fed its roots and flowing in the sap through every branch and twig. This is a beautiful picture of how connected, how grafted in we need to be to Jesus to soak up his life into ours, to take in those nutrients to produce his fruit. And I think John 15, 5 illustrates this so beautifully. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I think we so need to remember that. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Sanctification is God producing in us what we can't produce in ourselves. So what Paul is talking about when he says fruit, it is Christian character. It is not our achievements. 
Character is sadly greatly undervalued today in so much of life. We'd rather work out our best techniques, formulate successful strategies, and celebrate performances. Kind of exactly what I've always looked for in my how-to books or I write down in my weekly goals. We look on the outside and assess people by what they are doing, and we pay much less attention to what kind of character they have. We need to be careful not to confuse fruit with achievements. Our culture, Orange County, they're so focused on achievements. We need to be looking at the character. Fruit is about a change much deeper. It is a true radical heart change. But our part is to remain in him. John 15 says, my words need to remain in you. We need to drink in God's word and let it permeate our lives, not just for knowledge's sake, but to truly change us. I love the line, we take in God's word, not for information, but for transformation. And there's a great book by Eugene Peterson called Eat This Book. Well, I love the title as it gives a picture of how life-giving God's word is. He says we are to live out the scripture in response to reading scriptures. It means through our reading, we are letting another have a say in everything we are saying and doing. It is saying that being in his word and taking it in is what changes us. As branches, we receive life from the vine by eating his book and obeying. And like any relationship, we communicate. We communicate with Jesus through prayer, through time with him. We grow in our love for him and our love from him. Reading all he has to say to us personally assures us of his undying love. And that love naturally flows to others. And John 15 says, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. So we see obedience is part of it too. So let's look at all that abiding means. If we abide, we receive God's nutrients to produce the fruit in our lives. So abiding is taking in his word for true heart change, communicating with him, prayer that involves both talking and listening, hopefully more listening than talking, (laughs) obedience to what his word is telling us, and fellowship with other believers. So it is this utter dependence that enables us to draw from him the power essential to become more and more like Jesus to produce fruit. This radical dependence is hard for us, not just as sinners, but as Western thinkers. We all think that we are responsible for our own success and happiness. And it's only this connection and its production of real fruit gives us true happiness. I mean, think about yourself. Really, if you had love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, and self-control, what would your life be like? what would your relationships be like? (laughs) Um, Everything we do is a reaction to others should be an overflow of our experience of God's love. Life would be so wonderful. So how do we know if what we're experiencing is the fruit of the Spirit or just a natural tendency we have? Well, I have a good test for this, so we won't fool ourselves. I'll give you a personal example. When my husband started teaching the Enneagram about 25 years ago, I took the test, and I came out as a two. Well, if you know the Enneagram, the two is labeled as a helper. In reading all the other numbers, I thought, oh, two sounded like the best one. Helper sounds more Christian than enthusiast or a reformer. And I said this to Kim. I said, I think twos are the best. Yeah, that's a picture of me, except there would be a two on that podium. Well, then he continued to say, he said, you know, the the downside of twos is that they can be prideful. (laughs) I had just, I had just proven that. I went, whoops. So this, my being a helper is not evidence of any fruit because it did not come with the other qualities listed. Jonathan Edwards says, if you want to know if these changes are from the spirit, see if they are all working together. There was no love or gentleness with my being a two. There was just pride. And this is why Paul says fruit is singular. 
They are all part of one. They work together. They all have to be rooted in love. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. No matter what I do, if I have not love, I gain nothing. Tim Keller says change is symmetrical. If you are kind to your workers but scream at your kids, <laughs> that is not real fruit. If you boast that you have if you have self-control but you have no peace, that is not real fruit. We all have certain temperaments that we'd probably have if we weren't Christians. The good news is that we all have the potential for all of these because we are Christians. Seeing these working together is evidence of ripening fruit. Our patience should be based in love. Our self-control should be based in joy. These qualities are all relational too. They aren't about me, but they are how I react to others. And I think these are good questions too um, to ask. Is this the fruit of the Spirit? Am I growing in my capacity to love those around me? Mm -hmm. Am I learning to navigate conflict more lovingly? The true test is, are we growing in our love for one another? Ask yourself, ask yourself these questions. This is all a result, not of our temperaments, but a byproduct of life-giving connection to the vine. And our goal should be to have all of these qualities of the fruit of the Spirit. And the truth is, we all have the potential for all of these qualities in the fruit of the Spirit. So when we look closely at all the character qualities and see that none of them can be in isolation from the others, we might see that we are in far more need of His Spirit than we thought, which is good information. Okay, John Stott, a fabulous theologian and a wonderful author. He's written so many, he had written so many great books um, and he's passed away. He prayed every morning for God to produce and ripen every part of the fruit of the Spirit within him. And it hardly seems surprising that many people who knew John Stott personally said he was the most Christ-like person they had ever met. And I've known two people that knew him personally, and that's exactly what they said. They'd never met a more Christ-like man. God answered his daily prayer by making the fruit of the Spirit ripen in his life. So the seed with all the potential for us to become like Jesus is already inside of each one of us as believers. That is an amazing truth. It also rips away any excuses. <laughs> The more we are filled with God's Spirit, <clears throat> and the more the Spirit ripens His fruit within us, the more we will become like Christ. And that should be our goal. So right now, this time of the coronavirus and forced quarantine, one, I know it's really hard. I know it's lonely. I know it's frustrating. I know we miss our usual routines, but I thought with just the added stress of, of what we're going through and probably the added worry of what's going on in our country, I thought this is the perfect time for more of these qualities to burst forth. And we have time to really connect with Jesus, to spend time with him. We have time to attach to the vine. And I love the sign, be the you God created for such a time as this. We all are with family more, and there's a huge potential for us to be sharp and snippy and not patient with each other. And I thought, look at the fruit of the Spirit. Look at those nine qualities and ask, which of these need to be more present in me right now? It's a perfect time for all of us um, in these relationships in, with our neighbors, with everybody else. It's a perfect time to let Jesus do his gardening on each one of us from the inside out. We know that as believers, we all have the seed that can grow and burst through our marble slabs of excuses, our marble slabs of our past, of our regrets, and that seed can produce fruit for our own sanctification, that we truly can become more and more like Jesus. It's a gradual process, but the harvest will be beautiful. And I thought, wouldn't it be beautiful if we looked back and we looked at quarantine 2020 and we said, you know, that was a time of great fruit. So let me close now. I want to close with the prayer that John Stott prayed every day. Heavenly Father, 
I pray that this day we may live in your presence and please you more and more. Lord Jesus, I pray that this day we may take up our crosses and follow you. Holy Spirit, I pray that this day you will fill us with yourself and cause your fruit to ripen in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In Jesus' name, amen.